All right, folks, welcome to episode 10, part two, Tom and Lynn Sandals. Uh, in this episode, we are covering his reign of terror from 1990 to the year 2000. I'm Dan Brady. Alongside me is Johnny Smith. Johnny, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Dan. How are you? I am doing fantastic. Hopefully, we got the technical issues in check. So, uh, Let's hope. so in January, um, uh, Tommy Lynn Sells finds himself in Wyoming. Uh, Tommy comes across a desperate couple. They have bald tires, so he offers to uh, find a new one. So basically, he steals a truck, and and in that, he was caught and was sent to jail for about a year. Now, while he was in jail, they diagnosed him with a depressive disorder, um, a borderline schizophrenic disorder, all types of stuff like that. Um, he gets on medication. Uh, is again kind of a kind of a model prisoner. But on uh, January, does the medication help? Uh, a little bit, yes. But of course, once he's released from January, uh, from jail in January in 1991, he gets off medication. Uh, then he he goes to Colorado and then back to Florida. Uh, on December 9th in Mariana, Florida, the Christmas season was being celebrated with the annual parade. 25-year-old Teresa Hall, uh, Teresa Hall attended the parade with her daughter Tiffany, who was five at the time. Um, the little girl is exhausted by the end of the evening, and she's almost uh, asleep by the time they return home. The railroad tracks were 100 feet from their front door. Teresa prepared her daughter for bed. This all comes shattering. Uh, this whole perfect home, it's almost Christmas. Uh, their front door was kicked in. All the dreams were gone. Cells mm -hmm. raged to the home knocking everything out of his way. He lifted the table above his head, smashed it on the floor, splintering it. Then he jerked loose one of the legs and bludgeoned Teresa to death. Her daughter suffered the same fate not long after. Uh, Stalls fled the home, still holding the table leg in his fist. Uh, on March 4th, 1992, Sells was arrested in Charleston, South Carolina for public intoxication. He, <coughs> he received the 30-day sentence. On April 2nd, he was arrested again on the uh, basically the same charges. Public intoxication. Yep. Uh, as soon as he was let out, he left the mountains of West Virginia Embraced Cells next, their primitive rugged beauty fueled his next act of violence. Uh, at the age of 20, Fabian Witherspoon thought she could take care of herself. She's five foot eight, solid uh, athletic body, physical prowess uh, that a lot of women lacked. She looked tough. Uh, she had an attractive face, but her dark brown eyes held just enough of an edge that no one accused her of being cute. Um, on May 13th, <laughs> she was house-sitting at 906 Grove Avenue in Charleston, West Virginia. Um, it was an ordinary neighborhood where bad things didn't tend to happen. None of them are, uh, although she was nervous that day as she walked to the women's health clinic for a pre pregnancy test. On the way back to the house, uh, she felt peace with the world. The test was negative. Uh, then she saw a man in his mid-twenties with unkempt, matted hair and intriguing eyes. He was standing on the corner of Washington Street, and he held a sign uh, that read, Hungry will work for food. Uh, he told Fabian a tale of misery and woe in a soft voice with a hint of a southern accent. So he's laying on the char charm 100%. He's seducing her. Uh, he told her <coughs> his name was Tommy Sells and that he and his wife were living under a bridge. His children were hungry. Uh, Fabian felt a wave of 
uh, compassion for the man, and she felt a bit of sexual attraction to him, too. She brought him to her house to find mm -hmm. some food he could take back with him. She grabbed two trash bags, filled them both with food and clothing for him to take back. She smiled and asked if he needed anything else. Uh, she told her, Sells told her his wife really needed some underwear, so she went back to her bedroom to find some clean ones. When she turned around, he was standing behind her with a knife from the kitchen in his hand. Sells immediately. That's a, hell of a, that's a hell of a surprise. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, Sells immediately brought the knife to her throat and told her to take off her clothes. Fabian hesitated, but with the knife under her chin, she really had no choice. She removed her shirt, unfastened her bra, kicked off her shoes, and pushed off her socks and reached for the waistband of her pants. Then she froze. Sells had the knife clenched between his teeth. She pushed her hands away and pulled down her pants. As soon as he began to remove his clothes, she looked away and stared at the floor. Then he smacked, shoved, and threatened her into the bathroom and down onto his knees where he forced her to perform oral sex. Sells then pushed her back onto the floor, spread her legs, raping her. She lay there praying he would finish and leave. He stopped, rose to his feet, ordered her to get in the shower. There he raped her again, and then he pulled her from the shower, shoved her onto her knees once more, demanding she give him oral. Good uh, Lord, still, he just still not man, that's terrible. Still not uh, satisfied, he jerked uh, her over to the toilet and bent her over it. Just as he was about to sodomize her, she grabbed the. A uh, ceramic duck from the back of the toilet. She grabbed it and smashed it over his head. Um, she kept hitting him over and over again with the remains of the figurine. As they struggled, she was able to get the knife out of his hands. She stumbled from the bathroom to the front door, and then he grabbed her and tried to manhandle her back into the bedroom. She stabbed him. She grabbed, uh, and he grabbed her waist and regained. Yeah, she's a fighter. And regained Good her. He regained possession of the knife. He stabbed at her, and then she jumped back and received only a deep slice across her skin. She also got control of the knife again. They wrestled around the room, trading blows until he finally got her down on the floor with him on top of her. He strapped her ankles and wrists together with tape and secured the bindings with strips of sheets from the bed. He raised the piano stool over her head and beat oh, her man. Head and beat her bloody until the seat broke loose from the base. He then tried to slit her throat, but this time he panicked. The cut he made would only require a few stitches. He grabbed the boombox and the VCR and escaped from the home. He left behind the gifts she had stuffed into the bags. As soon as she became conscious again, she fought her way out of the bonds, wrapped herself up in a blanket, picked up her cordless phone, and it hurried outside to call the police. It's amazing she was getting able to get outside with her big balls. Yeah, man. Holy hell. I'm I'm glad she survived. That's nuts, though. Uh, before That's she, terrible. Before she left in the ambulance, uh, she informed investigators that the man who insult, assaulted her was Tommy Sells, and that he was sleeping by the river. So... Uh, so they show up, they know where he's at, they show up, um, they they arrest him, uh, you know, they interview him, check other people's stories and stuff like that, but basically uh, the sexual assault charges um, on June 25th, 1993, Sells was sentenced to an indeterminate term and not less than two years, but not more than 10 years for malicious wounding. The judge gave him credit for 402 days of time served. Fuck that judge. He was placed yeah, in a correctional, uh, correctional facility just south of Wheeling, West Virginia. Oh, hey, I'll pull it in. I've been there. Me too. Uh, Sells had a friend waiting for him behind bars. 
man named Billy Young. He watched Cells back from the moment he arrived uh, to the moment he left the jail. Cells started out as a model prisoner who did nothing wrong. He earned the designation of trustee, but soon he abused that position. Cells and another inmate, Gregory Carter, found a 357 pistol inside the prison. They planned to trade it for marijuana, but for safekeeping, Cells hid the weapon in the warden's office. Another trustee caught him and reported him. Charges were filed, but then dropped when Cells was moved to maximum security and Mount Olive Prison. Hmm. <clears throat> uh, You're just going around with gun. During this prison stint, he taught himself to read with the help of the Bible. Um, <clears throat> He dropped out of ninth grade uh, at the age of 16, never really uh, never really learned how to read or anything like that. Um, he worked hard at his self-education, pushing him to, uh, himself to reach his goal. He sent his first letter of his life from prison, 94. Uh, he struck a friendship up with a new inmate by the name of John Price. John was a nurse who had been working uh, for a home health service company. Three of his friends were found deceased after they injected themselves with a narcotic drug that was 10 to 100 times more powerful than heroin. Probably like John, fentanyl, or fentanyl or whatever. Yeah, John had uh, been the source of the drug. Um, so he goes to prison. Uh, he told Cells about his sister, Nora, who's 26 years old and a bit slow. Sounds like a perfect woman. Uh, she was the product of the special education classes in the public school system. She received a social security income check every month and visited her brother often. John introduced her to Tommy Sells. What an idiot. So a romance blossomed between these two. Um, they were allowed contact visits that sealed Nora's fate. Sells took advantage of her intellectual deficiency and sweet talk during the falling in love. She was easy for him to manipulate. She had a rough childhood and couldn't recall anyone being nice to her like Sells was. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and they wrote and talked to each other. Um, they talked about the day he got out. He informally proposed to her through a letter and then came the big day. Um, the the pr Mount Olive prison had an annual event where they let visitors uh, spend time an entire day with a prisoner um, on the prison lawn on a spring day. Cells asked Nora if she would marry him. So sweet. Um, oh, romance. While Cells was still in prison in April '96, they were married. From that day on, seventy five percent of Nora's checks went to Cells. As a sign of his gratitude, he got two tattoos done with her name on him. One was a rose on his neck. The other was a motorcycle with a dragon on his right upper arm. She was infatuated with him. I don't know the reference, but holy hell, there's some wild tattoos for a relationship. I chuckle, though, because I got t two tattoos on the inside uh, for my wife while I was in there. <laughs> that's, that's sweet. Yeah. Uh, so at this time of prison, he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but his mental illness wasn't treated. He was released in May of 97. Within days of being released, he left, left West Virginia and his wife, Nora, behind June 1st. Uh, he called her from Michigan and told her he wanted to get back together with her. She agreed, and he returned. Together, they hitchhiked and road trains to Tennessee. They settled down in the town of Cleveland. Oh, together. Oh, yeah. Hand in hand, jumping trains. Isn't it sweet? In the town of Cleveland? Tennessee. Oh, I was going to say. I mean, <clears throat> I guess that's okay because there's far shittier Clevelands they could have ended up in. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, on July 29th, the local police gave him a ticket for driving without a license. Cells abandoned Nora again on August 18th and went west. Uh, Nora, unable to cope on her own, went back to her home in West Virginia. On September 5th, Cells called his mother from Oregon, and then he, he's just traveling all over the place. Uh, yeah, he's all over. 
Then he called Nora's mother. He traveled east again and picked up Nora in West Virginia and took her to his mother's home in Missouri. By that time, Nora was pregnant. In October, Sells got a job as a mechanic. He managed to stay off drugs for three whole weeks, and the family had high Ooh. hope. They, they thought he was able to finally be able to settle down. However, neither Nora nor his job could keep him drug-free for long. He, uh, he came home one night high, and in no time, they were tracks up his arm. Uh, nothing could keep him tied to his home, and by mid-October, he was stalking his next victim. Uh, Sells, am Sells admitted to the murder of Joel Kilpatrick in private conversations, but he never confessed to the murder to the authorities. The following account was obtained by interview interviewers who spoke to Tommy Sells, but none of it has ever been proven. Sells stated that he traveled east from St. Louis on Interstate 64 when he arrived at Lawrenceville on October 13th, uh, 1997. It felt like it would be an uneventful evening. However, it turned out to be one of the community's most memorable nights. Sells first met Julie, Julie Ray at a convenience store where she treated him rudely, rudely, according to Sells. From that moment, he wanted revenge. Anger drove him to the front door of a house he'd never been to before. He carefully broke a window, making normal noise than he had to in order to get in. He directly went to the kitchen where he picked up a knife. He went to the first bedroom and found 10-year-old Joel killed Patrick, Kirkpatrick, asleep. Sells plunged the knife into Joel, who managed to scream and wake up his mother. He left the boy lying at the foot of his bed and slipped from the room and away from their approaching mother. Uh, she raced to the room yelling her son's name. She looked through the doorway and didn't see her son at the foot of his bed, so she turned, and that's when she saw Sells. He had his hood of his sweatshirt drawn up over his face, the drawstring pulled tight to conceal his features. She ran toward him, confronting the monster who stabbed her son. Good for her. She chased him through the glass doors and into the backyard, screaming for help. <clears throat> Outside, she tripped over something, and the intruder took the opportunity to turn around and hit her in the head. Um, when she finally raised herself up on her arm, she saw the man fleeing again. He pulled the hood down and revealed his face to her under a street light. She came to her feet again and rushed to a neighbor's house on the other side of the street. Once inside, she called the police to report her son's abduction. In minutes, officers arrived at the she scene. Didn't know you. What was that? She didn't know yet that her son was dead. No, she didn't know that the, the boy was inside the house. Oh, man. Uh, so police arrived. They found Joel in his bedroom, deceased. He had suffered multiple stab wounds. Julie was taken to emergency room to be treated for the scratches and abrasions, um, uh, wounds on her shoulders, internal bleeding, and a laceration on her right arm that required five stitches. While uh, Sells never told authorities he committed the heinous crimes, once again, he admitted to this um, in interviews and in private. Uh, Sells was on the move again, uh, <clears throat> heading for Springfield, Missouri. <clears throat> uh, <sighs> He walked the streets. He spotted a young woman with brown hair and followed her home. His unfruitful stalking drove him to a fever pitch. From his vantage point in a parked van, he sought someone who was a little more vulnerable. He saw a man with three children enter her apartment. The oldest was a 13-year-old girl with auburn hair, freckles on her nose, and a pretty grin. Her name was Stephanie Mahaney. Sells turned his focus and his victim, his fantasies on this potential victim. Suzette Carlisle, the, the mother, was in at home. She had been admitted to the hospital with life-threatening uh, pneumonia. Her fiancé, Rob Martin, had taken the children to the hospital to visit her. 
once they returned home, he played video games with them and stayed in the apartment until they were asleep. Uh, Stephanie was so tired, she collapsed on her bed in her clothes. <clears throat> At 11 that evening, Cell saw the man leaving by the back door. Rob locked it behind him and then left to return to Suzette's side, assuming the rarely used front door was already locked. He was wrong. Cells crept oh. silently through the dark and then slipped through the front door into the quiet home. He looked into the eighteen-year-old, into the room of the eighteen-year-old and nine-year-old, and then he found Stephanie. His eyes, her eyes, flew open as he slapped tape across her mouth, blocking her nose and making it hard for her to breathe. He jerked her out of bed and dragged her to the front door. Um, she tried to free herself from Cell's grip, but just ending him, ended up making him angrier. He threw him to the front seat of the van, and Stephanie immediately tried to escape. Um, Cell struck her in the face with the back of his hand, and she quieted down. She was afraid to make another attempt at an escape as they drove through the countryside. Cells finally parked off in Missouri 266 on Road 99 uh, <clears throat> to make her easier to handle. He injected Stephanie with a large dose of cocaine. He pulled oh, off of cocaine. Two, oh, cocaine. You would think that would not make her easier to handle. Uh, uh, she was crawling on the ceiling. I don't know what happened. Uh, yeah. when, when he brought his hand to her face, she cringed and tears came to her eyes. When he ripped off the tape, he raped Stephanie and then took her life by choking her to death. He gathered her clothing and abused body and walked towards the cow pasture, unlatched the gate, moved further from the road, dropping her jeans and shoes along the way. When he reached the pond, he dropped her body into the water. Wow. The stepfather returned home to the apartment at 5.30 the following morning to make breakfast. Uh, <clears throat> he went into Stephanie's room, uh, found out she was not there. Uh, so obviously panic. Um, <clears throat> none of the other kids in the house knew what was going on. Within hours, Stephanie's mother's filed a missing report. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, uh, thirty-four days. I imagine this guy was a suspect. Yeah, there because uh, she was a homebody, so they thought she was just abducted. Um, they talked to more than 30 people, searched six residences. They weren't able to confirm a sighting of Stephanie at all. <clears throat> then on November 18th, 97, a group of hunters were walking through a field and discovered the partially clothed body of a teenage girl submerged in a pond. Uh, they found a shoe and a pair of jeans nearby. The body was too decomposed to make a visual identification. Investigators called the families of all 26 missing girls to inform them of the discovery. Then they obtained dental records of all the girls. There was a lot of missing girls in the area at the time. Uh, using these records, they identified the body as Stephanie Mahaney <clears throat> the very next day. Hmm. So... Yeah. So he's um, just causing chaos and being evil everywhere he goes. Yes, a hundred percent. Pure evil is the best way I can describe him. On uh December fifteenth, uh Tommy Lynn Sells went back to his old haunt of Winnemucca, Nevada. Uh he stayed only one night at the Overland Hotel. Before he left the area, he drove to the uh, location where he left Stephanie Stroh's body, uh, reliving the fond memories of that night. He was back in St. Louis in time to get another traffic ticket on December 29th. Uh, that day, he left town, and Nora never saw the father of her unborn child again. Sells so was wasn't happy when he left St. Louis. Uh, Nora was going to give birth to a son in a couple months. Um, he had hoped his younger brother would raise a child, but Randy didn't want any children either. 
he feared that if he took Sal's child, then his brother might hit him up for cash and favors all the time. Tommy's mom, Nina, knew that Nora couldn't care for the baby alone. Uh, <clears throat> so with the help of her sister in Arkansas, she contracted an attorney to arrange for the child to be adopted. He came to her home with a school teacher to evaluate Nora and make certain she wanted to give up the baby. Uh, in April of 98, in Jones, Jonesboro, Nora gave birth to a little boy. She never saw the baby. He was immediately placed uh, with a family in that town where he lived for the following four years. Uh, Nora had her two tithes. She went back to St. Louis to live with her mother-in-law. The cells was nowhere uh, in that area when his son was born. Yeah. Well, that's probably a good, a better, better for that kid. January nineteenth, ninety eight. He traveled south. Uh, carnival season begins early in Texas, and Sells got a job driving the truck that hauled the Ferris wheel for the Heat of America and Aranza's path pass. He operated the ride too. The second week, the carnival carnival was in the town of Del Rio. On the evening of March 5th, uh, Jessica Levere uh, brought her kids to the fair. It was a cool night. While the kids rolled the Ferris wheel, she stood on the sidelines enjoying their smiles. Her green eyes and her welcoming face caught Sel's interest. He suggested it was a nice night for a cup of hot cocoa. The children got off the ride and begged to go on again. While they were back into the air, Jessica invited Sel's back to her home for a warm drink. Uh, Sells ended up spending the night and many other nights at her at home while he finished up his tour in Del Rio. On the day the carnival packed up, Jessica went to the grounds and grabbed a word here and there with Sells as he worked with the crew to prepare the caravan for travel. Sells was sitting in a rig in the parking lot when ready to go with the rest of the crew when Jessica showed up one final time. Uh, <clears throat> He asked her if she wanted to ride with him to Corpus Christi, Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, Jessica said yes, and they both climbed into the truck for the 14-hour drive to the Gulf Coast. She spent two days in the city. Then Sells put her on a bus back to Del Rio. She returned two days later with her hands on her his, hips. She asked him if he was ready to come home. Sells was ecstatic and told her that, yes, he wanted to go home with her. She went back to her vehicle and began living with her two teenage daughters and two younger boys in Del Rio. March 31st, she reported to the local unemployment uh, office to look for work. He found a job as a salesman and mechanic at Amigo Auto Sales. And uh, Jessica worked at a Chinese restaurant um, to help pay the bills. So she's got four kids, though. Yep. And then brings this guy in. Oh, man. Yeah, it's nut job. So, uh, big, big, uh, he was kind of happy, had a family, had pets. He wasn't doing drugs and alcohol for some time. However, June 28th, uh, Sell sets off on another road trip north to Sonora, Texas, then east to Beaumont. While he was in northeast Texas, he racked up two more traffic tickets. They were still outstanding a year and a half later when he was arrested for Kayleen Harris's murder. Um, then he returned home, attempting to hang on to the normalcy of domestic uh, existence. It only took one family crisis to undo Jessica's good influence and set him back on his usual path. August of 98, 20 inches of rain fell uh, quick and hard. The lights went out, and outside a woman yelled, uh, the San Felipe Creek had crested and was destroying the neighborhood. The woman, Jessica's mother, Virginia, grabbed a flashlight and pointed across the street to her daughter's house. Um, she pleaded with him to come over to her home, but Jessica said they would be okay. Uh, Sells and Jessica stood in the water, passing the children across the street. Virginia would put them safely indoors. Ten minutes later, she opened up her front door 
to discover there's water in her yard, Jessica and Sells joined her on the porch and watched as the water rose. Um, so big flood uh, basically wipes out the neighborhood. Um, it, you know, so it just caused rock chaos. Was so, it was it the flood that drove them over the edge again? Yeah. Um, oh wow! So basically, uh, they they lost the house. Sells and Jessica eventually settled more permanently in the trailer at the American campgrounds, about ten miles from their original home. Soon after they moved in, Jessica and Sells were driving down Route ninety. Sells pulled to the side of the road. Uh, and when Jessica asked him what was wrong, he asked her if she'd marry him. She said yes. Plans for their wedding raced ahead, and they were married in a church in Del Rio on October 22nd. In late 98, Sells worked for a few months at Ram County as a mechanic. Uh, <sighs> Sells started to get stressed. Um, he was abusing drugs and alcohol, and his work hours were erratic. Jessica couldn't understand his behavior, and it was intolerable. Her nagging turned into arguments, which turned into fierce fights. On February 2nd, or 22nd, uh, 1999, Sells left Del Rio. So he was in this area for a couple of years. Not killing, okay. not and he was living for the most part as a normal life. Um... <clears throat> So by March 5th, he was in Pensacola, Florida. After a phone call from Jessica, <coughs> he made his way back home. <coughs> Hold on. <coughs> on March 28th, he was thrown out again. Uh, Jessica demanded he get clean before he came home, and Sells hit the road once more. Which is an understandable demand, though. Oh, no, 100%. Someone can only tolerate so much. Um, uh, Jame and Je Debbie Harris uh, and their eight-year-old Ambera Halliburton moved into a rental trail in Gibson County, Tennessee, January 1999. Their new home was in the Caraway Hills. Um, by the end of the February, marital issues drove the tune of separation. They moved out of the trailer. Jamie moved to Gibson, and Debbie thought she had another place to live. However, it didn't work out, so she ended up going back to their former landlady. Um, <sighs> boop, 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 boop. Cells, um, <clears throat> Cells would relate the events of of what happened to the Texas Rangers who had arrested him. He said he took a 20 mile detour off of Route 40 when he reached Jackson around midnight on March 30th. He approached a small trailer. He knocked on the door and it opened. He slipped inside quietly and found a knife in one of the kitchen drawers. As he crept down the hall to Debbie's room, he spotted a or spooked a calico cat left off the bed and scurried into a hiding place. Just past the dresser's uh, cell noticed an overturned bucket next to the bed. Uh, it was serving as a makeshift nightstand. <clears throat> um, he eased into the bed and put a blade to Debbie's throat. Uh, Debbie didn't resist. She knew that she had to be quiet if she wanted her daughter to live. Um, Good point. Um, See, uh, most of the women he's killed have been very courageous women. Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, at, uh, after he raped her unresponsive body, Cell stabbed her multiple times. He stepped across the hall into the bathroom, holding the knife. He set it down beside the sink, picked up a bar of soap from the soap, and then cleaned the blood off of his arms. When he turned and looked into the hall, uh, the little girl, Ambria, was standing there silently. He chased her into the living room where he fought her and slammed the knife into her tiny body with so much force that it lifted her off her feet. 
He stabbed her again, and then she went limp. He shoved the knife into her a third time, loosening his grip, so she slumped to the floor. So he thought he heard a noise from Debbie, and he went back to the bedroom to make sure she was dead. He stabbed her one last time in the chest and left the knife there. Oh, uh, wow. <clears throat> yep. Just brutal. So, again, nobody knows, no evidence. Uh, Tommy Lynn Sells just comes in and ruins a family. And then, uh, you know, before the bodies had even been found, Seltz was already states away. He was hired on with the carnival, carnival in Greensboro, North Carolina. That job was to take him to San, San Antonio, where a nine-year-old girl would be his next victim. Um, Fiesta Ooh. is a 10-day celebration in San Antonio that begins in April. It features events that raise money for charitable programs. Uh, but for most ro- residents, it's an excuse for an extended party. Um, uh, so, you know, the big, big party, uh, and this one, uh, and this is when Tommy Lynn Sells arrives. On one of the largest celebrations was Fiesta uh, del Mercado. I know I whited the fuck out of that. Uh, which, <laughs> which ran daily from the late morning until midnight on the April 18th. Mary B. Perez, a nine-year-old girl, went to El Mercado with her extended family. Like all the Fiesta events, this one was heavily patrolled by police officers. Um around 10 that night, uh, Mary and her uncle went to a booth where he bought a round of beer for the adults. He didn't realize she had trailed behind him. And then, uh, and when he returned to the group, the third grader was gone. In the middle of the music and the uh, heady aroma of food, Cell snatched her and whisked her away. He hustled back into his truck and told her they were going to take a little ride. A mile and a half uh, away, they came to a stop near the stockyard. Cell pulled Mary out of the vehicle and led her through a hole in the fence. In that isolated area, he laid her down on a queen-sized mattress and forcibly undressed her as she fought back. When he finished raping her, he wrapped her T-shirt around her neck and strangled her to death. Good Lord Almighty. She's only... Yeah. Yeah. So at this point, like while she's dying, her family's freaking, freaking out. Uh, nobody knew she was missing. Um, and she was already dead by the time they realized. Um, by the time Mary was put to rest, Tommy, Tommy Sells uh, was already in Kentucky. Riding on trains, Sells traveled to Lexington, Kentucky, and signed up uh, at Labor Ready. He lived on the streets for a few weeks, sometimes renting a home for a day or two uh, from a woman who worked at a fast food restaurant. He eventually found jobs at Excel Building Services and the Lexington Recycling Center. On May 13th, he clocked in at Transylvania University. Hmm. Uh, Transylvania University? What, what, was he going to school? Or is that uh, where he's working? I, that's where he's working. Haley McCone was a 13 okay. year old girl. Uh, she was troubled. Uh, outside her family home, she was known to be a sunny girl who always lend a stranger a helping hand. She approached life with boundless injury and seemed to be getting along with everyone but her family. Um, her incompatibility with her family left her alone, isolated, and hurt. Luckily, refuge refuge was nearby. She ran out the road to her grandmother's, uh, and her grandmother told her she could move in after school. Um, to make money, Haley babysat, walked dogs, pulled weeds, just, you know, everything a kid does to make money. Yeah, everything she could do. 
On May 13th, she was not in school due to an appointment she had with her psychiatrist. First thing in the morning, she went to her grandmother's house to have breakfast. Afterwards, she stopped to play some games at her home. And then she got her on her bike and went to a park. As she rode to the park, she kept her eyes uh, open, just kind of being protective. She placed her bike against the end of the swing sets. Um, <clears throat> Cell's basic instincts were ignited when he saw the teenage girl on a swings alone. He looked around the park to make sure no one was there. Then he crept up to the girl, shoved her off the swing, slapped his hand over her mouth, held her tight. His other arm squeezed tightly to his sides as he as she struggled with him, and he dragged her kicking and squirming from the park into a wooden lot behind it. Uh, he demanded oral sex, um, afraid of what he might do to her. She agreed while Sells was removing his shirt. He heard the sound of a couple walking through the park, he put his hand over Haley's mouth to cover, uh, to keep her quiet. She didn't make a noise or struggle, thinking she'd be safe if she didn't put up a fight. Poor thing. Yeah. Um, once the couple was out of earshot, Sells yanked off Haley's clothes, pushed her into the dry leaves where he raped her. Again, she didn't struggle, thinking he would leave her alone when he was finished. However, he didn't just use her and walk her away like her previous. Um, <clears throat> Sells strangled her with her own shirt, twisting it tight and cutting off her air supply. She tried to aim for his eyes as she defended herself, but he managed to hang on and kill her. All fighters, ill go out swinging. Yeah. Absolutely, um, every one of them. Uh, Such a shame. Oh, yeah. Uh, almost to the end here, though. Uh, unfortunately, there's still a couple more lights to be extinguished, but almost at the end. Uh, brushing the leaves off his clothes and running his hands through his hair as he emerged from the wooded lot. He took her bike and pedaled away to the projects where he sold her bike for 20 bucks. That's all That's all that little girl was worth to him was 20 bucks. Mm-hmm. She for was probably so much better. You know, like, what the fuck, man? For it's 10 disgusting. days, Haley, Haley's family and the police stuck up posters. Uh, sightings of her were reported, and everyone had a swell of hope each time. But unfortunately, we know those are untrue. The one day, a man walking was walking his dog near Elizabeth Street Park. Dog picked up the scent. The owner didn't know what had gotten into the dog, but he allowed the animal to lead him into the woods, and he found young Haley's body. Oh, oh man! Yeah. Uh, absolutely terrible. Um, a lot the of body, these bodies were just moving about, too. Yeah. Like, just uh, very casually placed. I, I believe he just kind of killed in the moment, you know? So, like, he didn't think ahead. But he was, like, here, in this case, again, before the body was even found, uh, cells was under arrest in Madison, Wisconsin, again on the drunken disorderly charge. Uh, he had been waving a box cutter around threatening uh, people. The weapon earned him more than his usual overnight stay in the drunk tank. Uh, while he was in custody, he assaulted another inmate. Um, <clears throat> released on June 24th, he went home to Del Rio his arrival was not as welcome as he had hoped. He couldn't get his job back at Ram Country, and he had such a ferocious fight with Jessica that one of her daughters called the police. Uh, Sells ended up accused of molesting Jessica's daughter, Samantha. The social worker made it clear that Jessica and her four children could not stay in the trailer with Sells. Jessica took her family uh, to her mother's home, and on July 3rd, Sells drove north to Oklahoma. Probably did too. That's the thing of it. He probably did molest her. Yeah. So now we are going to talk about 
uh, 14-year-old Bobby Lynn Wolford um, in Oklahoma. She told her mother she was going with her friends to Canton Lake and Blaine County over the weekend. Um, Susan gave her daughter money for a trip, um, but Bobby Lynn didn't make it to the lake as planned beforehand. She and her friends embarked on a reckless uh, adventure <clears throat> that their parents uh didn't know about you know just doing kid things yeah just doing that shit that's what you do when you're younger that same weekend tommy arrived at kingfisher as he was driving up from del rio he was drinking heavily and uh taking cocaine throughout the day and night uh despite his altered state of mind he remembered the details of that night vividly his memory matched the evidence investigators found so I drove north on Route 80, uh, north of Oklahoma City, and then to the town of um, Wacomus, where he abruptly turned around and began heading south. During the early hours of July 5th, he pulled into a convenience store to inflate a leak of tire on his 79 Dodge. He also wanted to take a look under a hood. Um, is one of his most valuable possessions is an oppressive vehicle by Oklahoma standards at four in the morning <laughs> after, he sold, after he sold some cocaine to an older couple in the parking lot uh, he saw a young woman she was about five foot five with blonde hair blue eyes and many earrings um, <clears throat> she was using the telephone and complaining that she wasn't able to reach anyone he saw his opportunity and approached the seventh grader. He asked her why such a pretty woman was making such a fuss, and he told him she needed a ride home and couldn't get one. He told her he'd give her a ride and dropping his tools to the floor, invited her into her truck. Um, Bobby Lynn made herself comfortable on the passenger seat. Her relief at going home was tingled with the guilt where she'd been all weekend she hoped her mother wouldn't find out uh sells offered him some offered her some coke uh she said she didn't have any money and he told her she had something worth much more than money when she told him to oh, take a convenience store he backhanded her and told her to shut up uh intimidated uh by <clears throat> reality, bobby didn't dare move or make a sound she stared straight ahead as Sells drove northwest to Kingfisher and pulled over on the dark and isolated road. There again, he forced her to perform oral sex uh, and began trying to rape her. Before he could penetrate her, her desperation overcame her fear. She slapped and scratched at him. Hell yeah, Bobby Lynn. And then she. Yeah, aimed, good on you. Then she aimed a kick at his genitals. That's when his rage took over. <sighs> okay, Johnny, I am giving you a warning here, as I have had to do several times. Uh, he grabbed a ratchet from the floor and rammed it inside of her. Uh, oh, my. Yeah. Uh, when Bobby opened the truck door Ooh. and tried to flee, uh, Sells had his gun. He shot her in the head, and she fell to the ground dead. <clears throat> he cleaned up the mess. Uh, so, Sells grabbed their purse and duffel bag from his truck, threw them as far as he could. The pair of earrings she was wearing caught his eyes, so he stole those. Um, he removed the ratchet and pulled her clothing back into place before he lifted her lifeless body. Um, <clears throat> so, with his rage satisfied and the evidence well hidden, he began driving back to Ward, Texas. It just, it comes out of nowhere. It's intense as hell. And then he acts like nothing happened. Yep. Uh, unconfirmed sightings of Bobby Lynn continued to pour into the Kingfishers County Sheriff's Department. Um, months passed by and finally a witness came forward saying she'd uh, saying he'd seen a man take, talking to a girl who looked like Bobby Lynn. It was, had been in a convenience store parking lot. Forensic artists drew a sketch of the suspect. 
The following day, Hunter stumbled across the library car and some lipstick. The library car bo bore the name Bobby Lynn Wolford. Uh, they ended the hunting trip early and reported their findings um, to the authorities. Her yellow duffel bag, tennis shoes, and black purse were all found, and the police kept searching until they found her decomposed body. It wasn't held together with much other than her clothes. Uh, the advanced decomposition made it hard to tell, but head trauma led the, them to the uh, suspect that she died of a gunshot wound. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, that, she definitely did. Uh, it was December before DNA tests verified that the bones belonged to Bobby Lynn. Anonymous tip led investigators to uh, focus their attention on Dead Sports Bar, a tavern in Kingfisher. They interviewed the co-managers and confiscated drugs, hair samples, ammunition. But as a uh, fruitless effort, uh, Bobby Lynn's killer was long gone. As he usually was. He was out of there. Yep. He was like stick and move of serial killers. He was gone. And that's what kind of made him so hard to track down. Um, Sells returned to Del Rio. And after two rounds of interviews, the charges that he had molested Jessica's daughter um, were dismissed as unfounded. And her children moved back in with Tommy Sells. And he stuck around for a few months while he worked for Amigo Auto Sales. Um, so he kind of slipped back into, uh, you know, being a decent person, I guess, a you know, family man. Okay, in some type of, of of an act is what it was. Yeah, uh, it was his cool yeah. periods. His employer invited Sells and Jessica to go to Grace Community Church with him. Crystal and Trey, Terry Harris and their children, Katie and Lori, were at the services, too. When Terry Harris needed a new vehicle, he wanted to go to somewhere he could trust. Um, the guy that sold him the car was Tommy Lynn Sells. One evening, Sells showed up at Terry's home and invited Sells inside. This isn't important right now, but it will be. Um, okay. So he, he went inside Terry Harris's house, uh, met the kids, uh, his appearance creeped out the kids a little bit. Um, <laughs> I bet. He talked about his relationship and then he told, uh, Terry how lucky he was to have a wife who was nice and children that listened to him. Um, down the hall, Katie, confided to Lori that he didn't like the way Sells looked at her. Uh, Lori told her sister that she to tell her father, but Katie argued that her father would get into a fight with the man and she didn't want her father to get in trouble. Uh, <clears throat> so, Which is, is an understandable thought for a young, young girl to have. Uh, Route 44 goes through Joplin, Missouri across state line into Oklahoma. State 59 goes west to the small town of Welch, just 10 miles from the border, down a long driveway off a country road less than five miles of Welch was the modest trailer of Danny, uh, Daniel and Kathy Freeman. They lived in this trailer with their daughter, Ashley. Um, <clears throat> I will argue, and I... All the listeners and people watching right now, this is the most brutal murder that uh, Tommy committed. Um, they lived in this trailer with their daughter, Ashley. Daniel had built an addition that he had doubled the size of the trailer. And a rock foundation, a walkway dressed up the home's appearance. So it's a very nice trailer. Um, okay. Uh, Christmas of 1999 was a somber affair for the family. As the first one they were celebrating since the death of their son. Earlier that year, their 17-year-old son had been shot to death in a confrontation with a Craig County deputy. Ashley turned 16 on December 29th. And that night, her boyfriend had delivered a, a present and stayed for a short uh, visit. Her best friend, Laura Bible, was spending the night. 
Uh, while the four occupants were sleeping, Tommy Sells crept up the trailer. He dodged between the animal pens on their property, moving closer to the house. Just when creeping was, up. Just creeping up. When he was inside, he found a gun easily. Um, the Freemans had 14 guns in the home. They're a hunted family. Uh, he's, which, mm -hmm. anybody listening to this, lock up your fucking guns. Just do it. Just do it. Okay? Thank you. Uh, he stalked into the adult's bedrooms where they were sleeping and ran the butt of Daniel's own shotgun into his collarbone to get his attention. Uh, Sells wanted to be awake when he died. When Daniel opened his eyes, the barrels was pointed at his head, and the gunshot that followed a split second later blasted his body from the bed. The second shot to Kathy's head killed her where she lay. Sells uh, slid a knife across her nude abdomen, disemboweling her. He did the same Ooh. thing to Daniel, and he wasn't finished. He cut off Daniel's arms and right his right leg with an axe. In the other bedroom, the first shot uh, had awakened Laura and Ashley. Then the second shot blasted down the hall. Ashley recognized the sound. They huddled together, too afraid to move from where they were. They struggled to silence their gaps and tried to hear every sound to identify the noises they heard. In the kitchen, Sells was pouring gasoline in a puddle on the floor in front of the wood stove. He splashed some of it on the heater itself, and smoke rose from the surface instantly. Just as the girl smelled the first faint wuss of fire, a figure appeared in their doorway. He lunged at him with his hands clutching the shotgun, which he aimed at their heads. He ordered them out of the room into the cold night. Shoving, cursing, and hitting, he herded them into the van. They took off into the darkness before dawn arrived. Barreling down Route 44, Sells tortured both girls and then ended their lives. He claimed that he brought the van to a halt somewhere near the Red River and dumped the two girls in an isolated area. Their bodies had never been recovered. On December 30th, this massacre was... Uh, discovered. Um, <clears throat> when the home was searched, only a single body was found is Kathy Freeman. She is lying on the remains of the waterbed. Um, <clears throat> and it would take some time uh, and some digging to find the body of Daniel. Uh, <clears throat> so there's, it was there's, scattered about the ticket. Well, he basically disfigured this body with his shotgun, and with the fire, uh, with the fire going on, um, nobody really could find. Like his body was under debris and stuff like that. Okay. Um, hmm. So here we are uh, to the final one. Woo. Finally, and the one he gets caught for. Yes, um, he. Let's see. So, he returned home. He basically stole his wife's uh, van. He had been gone for days. He missed work, and money was needed to pay the bills. The two of them drove to the Pinko Pico convenience store where Sells attempted to get in contact with his boss on the payphone. He wanted to arrange a pickup for his final paycheck. He went into the store for some smokes and ran into Trey Harris. The two talked for five minutes. Back home, the fight continued and Sells left to escape uh, Jessica's anger. He sought refuge at Larry's length. Lakefront Tavern, where he drank uh, Coke and Jim Beam, uh, hit on the waitresses, asked them for sex. Um, so, so he's just kind of let loose. Um, at one point, he took a break from drinking, paid his tab, collected his change, let the bar to change from the shorts he was wearing to a pair of pants. Um, oh. Got to change. Yep. Uh, so he went back into the bar. 
and uh, blah blah blah. <clears throat> He, he left the bar at 2 in the morning. He stopped on his way home near a flea market where an old woman had an outdoor refrigerator. He reached in to pull out some beer and venison. While he ate, he decided he would go um, <clears throat> to Terry Harris. There's there's some sort of uh, uh, confusion at the bar, or at least that's what... Uh, what Tommy thought he thought Terry Harris had owed him money. Um, okay. Uh, so cells inf- insisted after his arrest, that he had fronted cocaine to Terry in exchange for five grand, but there's no evidence to co- corroborate that this was ever found. Um, in the wee hours of December 31st, 1999, six residents of a double wide trailer were fast asleep. Man standing outside the residence attempted to trip the lock on the back door with his knife, uh, but he failed. The family dog began barking in its pen, so he let it smell his hands, patted it on the head until it was quiet. Then he removed the screen from the window above an air conditioner, attempted to push up on the sash, but the drawn latch held the pane in place. Um, Tommy Lynn tells moved quietly to the front of the house to the window of of 14 year old Justin Harris room. Uh, It was raised to allow the coolness of the mid December air inside. The open window was perfect entry point for cells. He removed the screen, set it aside and eased himself into the window. Justin Harris had been blind since birth. So when he heard a noise, he thought his sister and a friend were teasing him. He told him to stop coming into his room and promptly fell back asleep. Boy, do you think this bothers him at all? How much luck is that, man? Yeah, but can you imagine, like, about what's to happen, knowing what had happened, knowing that guy was in your room and you're just, hey, knock it the fuck off, blah, blah, blah. Probably torments him, but he's got to realize it, it probably saved his life, too. Oh, yeah. Sells walked into the next bedroom, used his lighter to see the occupant. A seven-year-old Mark Searles was fast asleep in a, uh, their bed. Cell stood and stared at her in the flickering light, and then he turned away. He walked down the hall to the opposite end of the trailer where he saw Crystal Harris, the mother, Lori Harris, her 12-year-old daughter, fast asleep. He touched Crystal on the leg. She didn't stir, so he left her alone. So he walked back down the hall to find, uh, f- explore the final bedroom, walking over the threshold. All he heard was the quiet breathing of two people inside. He pulled the door closed behind him as he caught the scent of children in the room. Ten-year-old Crystal Sorrell Sur- 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 uh, stirred on the top bank, bunk, cells froze, and uh, Unable to identify the source of the noise because the room was pitch black. His right hand squeezed the knife handle, and then two steps he was leaning over uh, Katie Harris on the lower bunk. Uh, he told her to wake up and then laid down next to her with his hand on her throat. The other uh, hand held a 12 inch bony knife. Mm. When she asked, what are you doing? He didn't respond. Instead, he slit open her shorts and her panties and slit her bra in two and returned a knife to her throat while his free hand fondled her. She jerked free, tumbled out of bed to the side closest to the wall. She ran for the door, shouting for someone to go get her mother, but Sells was already there blocking his path. He stabbed at her and drew first blood. She said he oh. cut her and flipped on the light and looked at the wound above her arm. Pulling her towards them above, Crystal woke up with a start and peered through the slats of the top bunk bed. First, she saw Katie, then she saw a man she recognized as Tommy Lynn Sells with his hand clasped over Katie's mouth. Without warning, Sells slit Katie's throat, and Crystal watched as the blood raced down her friend's neck. Uh, Sells oh, pulled the knife back, and sliced again, deepening the wound in the 13-year-old girl's neck. Then he lost control, and as Katie slid to the floor, he stabbed her multiple times. Then he 
turned to look at Crystal, who had her hand at her throat. He told her to remove the hand, and she asked him not to hurt her, but that didn't matter to Tommy Lynn's cells. He slit her throat anyway. And as quietly as he had come in, oh, just wait. As quietly as he came in, he left the premises, unaware that the other occupants were uh, still alive. Crystal, with her throat slit, waited until she heard a car start and leave, and she felt her way to the bedroom door and fled into the night. She ran a quarter of a mile down the street. Her bets woke to his alarm clock going off at 4.45 that morning. He wanted to get up early so he could watch the world's first New Year's celebration, which would happen in New Zealand at 5 o'clock. When he heard the alarm, he changed his mind and went back to bed. Outside in her plaid boxers and a t-shirt, Crystal was stumbling down the road. There was no street light and no moon and no route. <clears throat> she stepped onto the front porch of the nearest trailer. <clears throat> um, so she, she went further up the road to a white trailer with brown green trim. It is the home of Herb and Marlene Betts. She rang the doorbell and waited. Herb glanced at the clock. It was two minutes before five in the morning. He pulled on his pants, wondering who was at the door. Crystal leaned on the doorbell again, and by the time Herb reached the door, the pounding of a fist echoing through his trailer. Herb asked who was there, but Crystal wasn't able to speak because her voice box had been cut. Herb turned on the light and looked outside to see Crystal on the porch. She raised her chin and pointed to her bloody throat immediately calls for his wife to call the police. When the police arrived at the Harris home, they woke up Crystal and her daughter when they entered. When asked if anyone else in the residence was hurt, Crystal had no idea what they were talking about. Yeah, uh, I bet. It is a hell of a shock. So they, they reached Katie's room. They found her battered corpse. She was nude from the waist down. The cut in her neck was obscene but they checked for a pulse anyway. They couldn't find one. The family were, was removed from the trailer and the investigation uh, began. So we are at the end of part two. Uh, this is the murder that ultimately uh, gets Tommy Lynn Sells arrested uh, because now uh, we have a, a bona fide witness who knows Tommy Lynn, uh, this badass girl, uh, walked a quarter mile yeah. down the road with her throat cut, you know. Um, and from there, every woman in this, it was just fighters, man. They were all fucking fighters. She would later do the talk show circuit stuff like that. Um, but she's ultimately the one that sat in the courtroom and said, Yeah, that's that fucking guy right there. That's him. Good. So, oh, good. Uh, We'll uh, we'll be back tomorrow night to record uh, episode ten, part three. We're going to cover, uh, you know, the sentencing, uh, his arrest, and then uh, the the wonderful stuff that happens after that, including the lethal injection. Yeah, I'm very curious, I'm very yeah. curious about everything. But like it was just right, so brutal, like. Guys, if I was quiet this episode, I just, I want to apologize. I just, it was so much brutality. There's nowhere to add certain things, you know? Oh, hey, it's your aunt. Yes, it's very sad. Yeah, it was terrible. Ugh. It was all brutal and, and so unnecessary. But to like, him, all of it was, was uh, just... just Oh, all right. Uh, on behalf, I'm Dan Brady, my partner in crime, Johnny Smith. Thank you guys for listening, for tuning in. Uh, please like, share, subscribe, wherever you're listening to. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you, everybody. See you later.